go back to the beginning Can't control
good morning. We want to welcome you to the services of First Baptist Church of Palmer, Texas. We're still uh, meeting without a group here at the church, but we're hoping to be able to start our services back up soon. I, I'm hoping for sometime in August. A lot of other churches are starting on August the 9th, so we're just going to see how it goes. We want to be safe. Uh, we have... Um, uh, a lot of elderly people in our church and people whose health are compromised. And so we want to be sure that we're being, um, being cautious uh, about that. But at the same time, uh, we're so anxious and so looking forward to uh, meeting back here in the church. You know, when we fired our services up in June, I was uh, personally very pleasantly surprised to, uh, to know that we had um, like 65 in church one Sunday, 61 another time, and and uh, in the 50s, and and from what I've heard about other churches, that really was not bad. So, so I just want to uh, just say kudos to my wonderful church for uh, for being here during those times, and and we're looking forward to meeting again, hopefully in August, and then uh, hopefully as the the virus uh, flattens out and and as we see a little bit more normalcy to life, we're, we're hoping and praying that uh, we can get back to normal, do the things we used to do. I'm looking forward to it. But at this time, I really don't have any announcements to make, uh, only that uh, I thank you for uh, logging on to this service, if you did. And uh, we want you to remember our church when you pray, and I want you to pray for me as I try to preach uh, I feel as heavy a weight on my shoulders to preach to an empty church, uh, knowing that this is going to be out on uh, the internet and Facebook. I still feel that weight of responsibility to, to deal with the Word of God and to deal with it properly. So you pray for me to that end. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we will begin our message. If you would bow with me, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this wonderful privilege to get to stand in this place and preach. We thank you for your word, and I thank you personally that you called me to uh, the ministry. Dear Father, I've not always been faithful to do exactly as you'd have me to do. I've, I've had feet of clay, and I have failed in many ways. But I thank you for your loving mercy and grace. Uh, that abides with us, and thank you for opportunities such as this. Father, I pray especially right now for some close friends that I have uh, who are in the hospital uh, suffering with COVID. I, I think in particularly of uh, my friend Andrew Branca, one of my working cohorts a few years back. I ask you to restore him. There are many others that we have read about on Facebook and that we've heard uh, from other sources that are suffering with the, the virus. And we just want to pray for your healing hand to be upon them. I thank you, dear Father, for uh, the ones of our church who are so faithful and so busy to tend to uh, details of the church while we're uh, not meeting, dear Father, uh, I ask you to <clears throat> just convey a very special <clears throat> blessing upon them. Now, bless us as we look into your perfect law of liberty uh, today. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're continuing on in our study <clears throat> through Matthew chapter 5 through verse 7. We're dealing with, uh, we've dealt with the Beatitudes and and now we're dealing with some other aspects of the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, there's no greater message to preach than uh, to try to preach the message that Jesus preached 2,000 years ago, uh, except Jesus was perfect, and he delivered it perfectly. And of course, he being God in the flesh, uh, made his messages ever so powerful. Now today we're dealing with the law. In fact, the title of our message is The Absolute Truth of God's Law. And we're going to look at um, uh, verses 17 through 20 of Matthew uh, chapter 5. This is a very familiar passage. Probably many of you have been able to quote 
this passage of Scripture. But I've titled this message, The Absolute Truth of God's Law. And there's a reason why we use the term absolute, and I'll try to explain that in just a moment. But he said here in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 5, he said, Think not that I am that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, uh, shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The absolute truth of God's law. I'm going to relate a, a few stories, a few short stories uh, that hopefully will illustrate this message today. There's a Harvard professor years ago, and by the way, he was a non-Christian. He was a professor of law in Harvard, he made this statement that he feared that Western culture was doomed to relativism. Now, I'll explain that word again in just a moment. Because it had no absolute. I'm going to explain that word in a moment. No, uh, no absolute when it came to a moral compass. There is no absolute uh, when it came to the subject of law uh, and order. Uh, this was quoted from a man who was a non-Christian, but he's a professor of law at Harvard uh, University. Now then, I want to try to explain what the word absolute means. The, I looked it up in the dictionary, and we use it kind of loosely. You know, you are absolutely correct. Uh, uh, that man was going absolutely too fast. So we, we use the term quite a bit, but the word actually means independent of arbitrary standards and measurements, free from imperfection. Now then, I think it's a wonderful word to describe the law of God because the law of God is totally independent of arbitrary standards because the law of God is in a class all of its own. The law of God has its own standard. The law of God is the plumb line. It is the basis. It is the basis for law. And if you read the history of our nation, you find that the framers of our Constitution, as we mentioned last week, they used the law of God as a plumb line in order to establish the Constitution for what has become the greatest nation in all the earth. And some say since the history of time. And so God's law is absolute. We must remember that. And Jesus treated the law as absolute. And he did not come to destroy the law. He came to be the fulfillment of uh, the law. Now then, many people have said, well, uh, you know, they take some verbiage that we find Paul said to one of the churches that, that when grace came, the law was rendered inoperative. And that was, uh, that was in reference to the fact that under the old law, a person could only uh, find salvation as they, they brought their sacrificial uh, animal blood to be uh, sprinkled on the, uh, the altar uh, and the, the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could do that. And then they had to depend upon the high priest in order to, to confess their sin before God Almighty. And God the Father 
uh, was housed, his presence was in that holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the mercy seat was. And so, so consequently, whenever a person, a worshiper came to God's house back in those days, this is the, the format, this is the path through which they received forgiveness of sin. Now then, all through the Old Testament, there are, there are types, there are pictures. There's picture after picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him pictured in the brazen serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. We see him in the skins that, that some animals had to die in order to provide clothing for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness in Eden after they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so uh, we see pictures of Christ all through the Old Testament. Now, Old Testament saints were saved in lieu of that coming wonderful day when the Lamb of God, which was slain from the foundation of the world, would hang upon a cross just outside Jerusalem and give his life's blood for the remission of the sins of man. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, he was literally God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. He was God tabernacled among us. And this is the path to salvation today <clears throat> under, the New Testament, uh, under the New Testament era today. But uh, Jesus did not come to destroy the law and the principles of the law. Basically, the principles that God gave Moses on Sinai on the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, those laws are still firm and they are still to be, they are still to be uh, adhered to. They are still to be obeyed. They are still to earmark the lifestyle of believers in Jesus Christ today. Now then I want to talk to you about that other $5 word that I mentioned a while ago. It's called relativism. Now I don't use that word very much. <clears throat> and you may ask, what does relativism mean? Relativism is a doctrine which teaches the teaches that morality and law just float along and adapt to the flow of the culture and society. It is a state which practices, or rather a state or a country which practices relativism is a state that disregards the law. Now let me explain what I believe that word is implying here. Now our nation has been moving uh, at, at warp speed toward relativism. In other words, there is, there is no uh, plumb line. We do not adhere to the laws of God. Do you realize as a nation we are breaking the laws of God? And not only are we breaking the laws of God, but we are, uh, uh, we are celebrating the fact that we break the laws of God. That's kind of hard preaching, but it's the truth. And you know that it's the truth. It's a sad state of affairs when a country reduces itself into seeking to set up law without regard to God. But we have people in Washington today who are bent on establishing laws which absolutely exclude and ignore God the Father. You know what, this type of governing uh, is not new. <clears throat> I think it probably had its beginning probably back when Samuel's sons, Joel and, and Abiah, they were judges in Israel. They were judges of the land. And they turned away from governing the people as they should, according to the law, and they took bribes. And they perverted judgments. My gracious, that sounds like Congress today. Listen, there are people in Washington who have made themselves fat and made themselves rich uh, off of perverting judgments and taking bribes. Again, you know it, and I know it too. And so a country that behaves in that way is a country that has moved away from the absolute the absolute law. We have moved away from that absolute law that the framers set up uh, 
200, almost 250 years ago. There are some, um, uh, there's some characteristics of a nation that has reduced the law into uh, a bunch of relativism. First of all, that nation disregards God's law. Secondly, that nation abandons truth, justice, and morality. You know what? When I jotted that down, I remembered Superman. Remember watching Superman back in the 50s, if you're, if you're an old codger like I am? Um, you remember that as the show came on, uh, the people that were announcing Superman said he stands for truth, justice, and the American way. Oh, and we were proud to hear that. And we were proud of Superman because he stood for those wonderful tenets. But you know, we're living in a nation today that does not espouse those tenets. Truth, justice, and morality. A nation that has, has left God's law is a nation that tends to want to build a governmental system based on humanism. I don't want you to know humanism is, is growing by leaps and bounds. And it's been around for a long time. It's not anything new. Humanism has, uh, has sought to infiltrate our system for uh, well over 100 years, maybe more. Our nation has been on a moral free fall at least until 1963. Probably it began in the late 40s. But in 1963... There was that, and you'll think I'm unkind when I say this, but there was that evil old woman who stomped her foot and threw a fit, and the cowardly government just simply acquiesced to, to her rantings, and prayer was taken out of the schools. And I think that if you were to look at a graph that, pinned, uh, that, uh, that described the, uh, the spiritual and moral uh, uh, tone of our nation, I think you'll find that in 1963, it took a very deep plunge. And then it was about 10 years later that the Roe v. Wade case uh, ushered in uh, mass murder of human fetuses. Now then, whenever you get on a road toward uh, moral relativism, Whenever you are on that path, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So today, they are espousing and celebrating partial, partial birth abortion. And now there's even some, some movement out to take a full-term baby and, and lie him upon a, 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 a gurney somewhere and tell the parents, go out and have a little lunch and and think about whether or not you want to keep this baby or not. And we'll, we'll try to keep him comfortable until you decide. If you decide you don't want him, well, we'll, just, we'll just let him die. Listen, this is where our nation has come today. And don't you think for a moment that God the Father is not going to rain judgment down on a nation that forgets his law and perverts his law. It's going to happen one of these days. There's a verse in Isaiah that is so up to date today. You know, some people think the Bible is archaic. That it's out of date. Listen to what Isaiah said hundreds and hundreds of years ago. In Isaiah 5 and 20, he said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. <clears throat> We're living in those days today. Evil is celebrated and condemnation is celebrated. But morality and holiness and the scripture and right living is condemned in our society today. We're living in a generation today where good is regarded as evil and evil is regarded as good. Scripture says it would be that way in the, the last days. I read something very interesting. I want to share it with you. 
Now, I, one of my favorite TV preachers is uh, John MacArthur. I make no bones about it. I love to listen to MacArthur expound of the Word of God. John MacArthur was told in an interview uh, one time, uh, my lady that was uh, a writer for a magazine, the subject had to do with whether or not the biblical view of the family is relevant today. Oh, listen, there's a growing number of people who believe that the traditional biblical view of, of the family and marriage is archaic, that it's gone by the wayside. It's no longer valid in our culture today. Well, after Dr. MacArthur gave his biblical views concerning the home and concerning marriage, she replied, well, you don't realize that times have changed, that the Bible doesn't fit today anymore. What an absolutely stupid, stupid thing to say. But there are people in this world that are saying things that stupid and even stupider. But he replied to her, he said, no, it is that today doesn't fit the Bible anymore. It's today that's wrong, not the Bible. There again, there's where relativism has crept in and has sought to take God's law and, and twist it and turn it and pervert it. Uh, uh, in a radio interview, the same guy, John MacArthur, the interviewer said, you know, everybody has their own interpretations. And MacArthur said this. He said, the point is this. He says, if the Bible confronts you where you don't want to be confronted, they say the Bible is out of date or needs to be reinterpreted. Now, that's what this old evil world is saying today. The Bible is archaic. It's out of date. It needs to be reinterpreted. But then MacArthur said, but in reality, this lost and dying world is what's out of date and needs to be reinterpreted. We are living in a world today that denies the authority of the law of God and deifies humanity. That's where we are today. There are some that may hear this that won't like to hear that, but it's the truth. But I want to share with you just a few, about three thoughts here concerning the scripture that we've read. The three thoughts that we see in, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 concerning Jesus' uh, take on the law of God. Number one, in verse 17, Jesus came to fulfill the law. That's what he, he didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come in order to pervert the law or twist the law. He came to fulfill it. He came and fulfilled it with what we know as New Testament believers as grace. Old Testament believers lived under the law. They had to give animal sacrifices. They had to... I have the high priest to ask for forgiveness for their sins in the Holy of Holies. Um, but today we are in the age of grace. In the Old Testament, the law pointed out that, that of sin and the consequences of sin. The law could not save. It could only point out the consequences of the breaking of the law of God. Uh, and that was the way to salvation in Old Testament times to trust in a Savior that they were looking to in the future. But meanwhile, they used animal sacrifices. The blood was symbolically shed. It was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Old Testament saints saw foreshadowings of Christ, as we said a moment ago. Old Testament saints could only receive forgiveness when the high priest sprinkled their sacrificial blood on the mercy seat. But today we have grace because of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 2,000 years ago, he was slain, but in the mind of God the Father and Jesus Christ, who was there in, in, the, in the foundation and before the foundation of the world, in the mind of God, Jesus Christ was that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus came to fulfill the law. Secondly, Jesus embraced the authority of the law. He embraced its absoluteness, if that's a word. It is absolute. 
It stands alone. There is no other law but the law of God. If a nation is built upon any other law, any other precepts other than the law of God, that nation is going to crumble. That nation is going to be destroyed. And by the way, I've heard tell that uh, there are very few nations that ever survived past 200 years. Well, why do you suppose that is? I suppose it's because they turned away from the law of God. It's absolute. It stands alone. I love what Jesus prayed when in John chapter 17. If you read the entire chapter of John, the Gospel of John 17, it is a prayer that Jesus is praying for you and praying for me. He says, I pray for all of those that you have given me. Did you know God the Father, if you're saved by the grace of God today, and you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you were given to Jesus as a gift. Can you imagine Jesus rejoicing over having the likes of me as a gift that's what the entire 17th chapter of John is talking about. It's talking about uh, Jesus praying for those whom God has given to him. And he said here in verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Folks, you don't know where truth is? Truth is in the word of God. Truth is is in God. Truth is in Jesus Christ. They not only epitomize truth, they created truth. That is truth. If you know the Word of God, if you're hiding the Word of God in your heart, you're hiding truth in your heart, and you're seeking to live truth. But now today's culture is seeking to overturn those historical interpretations. The church of the living God has for centuries espoused the, the purity of the blessed law of God. That is until today when a lot of drooling liberals have crept into so-called churches and you have drooling liberal uh, professors who are in so-called uh, uh, Institutions of higher learning, which at one time were established to be, uh, to be uh, seminaries and to teach young preachers to preach the Word of God. And somewhere along the way, they started drifting and liberalism crept in and espousing all kinds of unholy, ungodly, filthy lifestyles became espoused by them. Jesus embraced the law of God. Today's culture not only seeks to overturn historical interpretations of the Scripture, but today's culture denies the, uh, the inerrancy of the Bible. They say that you can't take everything that it says, and so therefore we have to redefine it for you in order to fit your sin and to fit our, our relativism uh, society that we live in today. No, that's not the way it is. Any society that drifts off on its own and seeks to establish its own laws is a society that's going to crumble. It's a society that's going to be destroyed. Only when it is built upon and based upon the word of the living God. And it is the living word of God. Did you know that this book is alive today? It's filled with the word of God. It is the word of God. And finally, Jesus pronounces judgment upon those who regard the law. Look at verses 19 and 20. It says, uh, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I think what that means is, if a person is living a life that, that sort of uh, violates the law of God, no, not just sort of violates, it does absolutely violate the law of God, 
And they're going to be least in the kingdom. I think that means that these are probably going to be some people who were redeemed. They were saved, but somehow they didn't grow in grace as they should have. And so their breaking of some of the laws of God caused other men to, uh, to stumble. And there's a, a great judgment. There's a great warning that comes to the New Testament church about someone who lives their life in such a way before a young convert that they cause them to stumble. There is a great judgment that's going to come upon people who do not live within the boundaries of the law of God. Yes, the law of God is still valid today. Keeping the law won't take you to heaven. It's accepting the grace of Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross of Calvary that will only take you to heaven. But Romans chapter 14, verses 14 through 16 says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. This is Paul writing. He says, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now what he's referring to is the fact that a lot of that meat was at one time offered to pagan gods. And the pagans went through their evil, devilish rituals. And when the ritual was over, the meat, which was still marketable, they sold it in the marketplace. And then people would go and buy that meat in the marketplace and they would partake of it. And Paul said, I don't mind eating that meat. It's nothing to me. It's just meat. But he said, there's something else that comes into play here. And that is there are some young converts in the church. They too were, were converted from paganism. And so consequently, those practices of paganism... Uh, anytime they see them, it violates something in their heart. And then if they see Pastor uh, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, partaking of that meat, and they know that it's meat that was offered to idols, then it causes them to stumble. It grieves their hearts. And, you know, Paul said, you know, if I eat that meat and it offends, uh, then I'll refrain from it. In fact, that's what he said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 and verse 13, he says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Folks, what a powerful message given to the church today about how we ought to live. Live according to the dictates of the Spirit of God today. We are living under grace today. But even those things that you do not consider to be wrong. If you partake of them and someone was converted from those, those implements that were used in their old life. And they see it as sin. Then it causes them to stumble. I want to reread uh, Matthew 20 here. He says, for I say unto you. Oh, and by the way, uh, we were talking about. Uh, I had this last point divided into two parts. The first one is those who serve as wrong examples to others through lawless living. That was the first point. I forgot to tell that. And the second point is where he's writing to those who are self-righteous. There's nothing that is a greater stench in the nostril of God than, than pride, but there's not a closer double first cousin to pride than self-righteousness. In fact, I'd venture, to, I'd venture to say that they're virtually synonymous. Now look at what he said here in verse 20, and you'll have the message. He said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why is it that someone with the spirit of the scribes and Pharisees with a self-righteous heart. Why will they not enter into heaven? I'm going to tell you why. Because they are trusting in their own goodness to get them to heaven. They were self-righteous. They, they were arrogant. They were boisterous. 
They were belligerent. And it was really confusing to people when Jesus Christ came around. And he was also a rabbi, a teacher. But he didn't have that cocky, arrogant, belligerent, obnoxious personality that the scribes and Pharisees had. He walked in humility because he was God in the flesh. Now, folks, what, what Jesus is telling us here is if you are living a self-righteous life, that means that you have not acquired the righteousness of Jesus Christ into your life. And that's the way we're saved. We're saved whenever Jesus Christ clothes us in his righteousness. And then when we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then our righteousness is, like he said in the Old Testament, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Don't think you're going to ever get to heaven by pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and, and claiming yourself to be righteous when you're not. And that's what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. And Jesus said, if you have their righteousness, forget about getting to heaven. I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Of heaven. May God bless you is my prayer today. I, I think the invitation has already been given to you through this message, but I just want to implore you and invite you wherever you are. You may, you may be in your car riding down the road and maybe listening to this. I hope you're not watching it while you drive, but maybe you're in a hotel room or maybe you're someplace else, but maybe you heard this. And maybe you felt the, the wooing power and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit come into your, your heart. And when that happens, that means that God is calling you. He's calling you to repentance. You say yes to him. Say, yes, I come, dear God. Lord Jesus, I come. I'm coming to you. On bow for prayer. Dear Father, I pray that this message will not fall upon deaf ears. I pray, dear Father, that it will be received and the Spirit was given. If I know my heart, dear God, I was angry only at the ugly sin that I was seeking to preach against. But, dear Father, I hope that a heart of love for lost sinners has likewise come through. And I ask you to draw those to you that you're going to save. We love you. And we praise you. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen. May God bless you. And I hope you have a wonderful day today in the Lord.